Look, turn with me to the word of God very quickly. Now it happened the day after. Read now the New King James Version. That he, talking about Jesus, went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him. And a large crowd, and when he came near the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow. And a large crowd from the city was with her. When, when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Yeah. Then he came and touched the open coffin, and those who carried him stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. So he who was dead sat up and began to speak, and he presented him back to his mother. Then fear came upon all, and look, they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen up from among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. Let's drop back to verse 14, 14 and 15, because that's, that's where I want to take my thought from today. Then he came, uh, and he touched the open coffin and those who carried him stood still and he said young men I say to you arise so he who was dead sat up and began to speak uh, I want you to say this with me prophetically because I believe that God is speaking to us out of his word today about some situations that he's about to turn that there are some things that were planning to die that God is about to turn the whole situation around. If I got a witness here, just wave at me. You're down my street already, Pastor. And I just want you to say this prophetically. Look at somebody and shake them by the hand. Come on, shake them by the hand. Just looking right now. You're going to be the prophets this morning. Shake them by the hand and tell them, neighbor, the funeral is canceled. It's canceled. It's canceled. It's canceled. It's canceled. I don't know what you was getting ready to bury. I don't know what you was getting ready to put in the ground. I don't know what you was getting ready to walk away from. But God said, look at somebody and tell me this funeral is canceled. It's canceled. He turned it. Father, bless your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It's canceled, bruh. The evidence is there. The enemy is speaking in your ear. All the information is there. Call the pallbearers and say we don't need you. Yeah, tear up the resolution. Cancel the flowers. This funeral is canceled. The most profound of all the miracles Jesus performed during his earthly ministry are those in which he raised somebody from the dead. And perhaps it's because of the finality of death. Death announces it's over. It's so final. What makes it so tragic is how final it is. It's not, it's not like sickness where you may get sick and through some miracle of science or medicine you recover from that situation. Death announces it's over. It's a, it's a period at the end of the sentence. It's, we're done with that. And so because of the finality of that situation, whenever Jesus raised someone from the dead, there was no denying that something significant had occurred. You couldn't explain it away like some medical miracle. If somebody gets COVID, if somebody gets cancer, if somebody gets some other disease and then they are healed, uh, you could always say this was because I changed my diet or I started eating herbs or I use some medical medicinal way of fixing it. And sometimes when God does things through either medicine or miracle, we always have a tendency to take the blessed, to take the favor from God and begin to put it on modern medicine and men. But when death occurs and God raises a thing, there is no denying it had to, something great had to happen. Come on, talk to me. 
So, so there are only three stories in the Bible where Jesus raised specific persons from the dead. Some of you Bible scholars will remember the 12-year-old daughter of Jairus, uh, the Jewish woman, the, the synagogue ruler, that God raised his daughter. And some of you more famously will remember Lazarus, who had been in the grave for four days, and Jesus raised him, right? So those three. But this one in particular, this was the first, the very first of the three people that Jesus ever raised from the dead. I underscore the word first because this miracle occurred near the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, right? So, so because it was the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, uh, the fame of him was just beginning to get out. And large crowds of people were just starting to follow him around, but they knew him as a healer. They knew him as somebody who performed healing. So he opened blinded eyes. He, he, he opened deaf ears. He, he cast out demons. He healed people of leprosy. And so because of his healing ministry, he had already begun to gather a following of people who knew him as a healer. But nobody had ever seen him raise anybody from the dead. You see, they knew him as somebody who could lay hands on the sick. They knew him as somebody who could open blinded eyes. They, they had experienced God in that respect. And so even with those things that he had done, he already had a gathering. But they had never experienced him as somebody who had raised anybody from the dead. So follow me here. There was really no point of reference here. They didn't have the benefit like we do of being able to open the Bible and look at Lazarus, who was raised some time later. Or Jariah's daughter, who was raised some time later. Because this was the very first one, mm, they really had no point of reference. You weren't really sure what God was going to do. There was no precedence to go by. There was no event to refer back to and say, because Jesus did this, he's going to do it again. He, there was nothing you could point back to and said he did that before. That's why you can't necessarily, uh, there weren't people who weren't, they weren't people, follow me here, they weren't people who were seeking Jesus in this situation. It's one of the rare moments in the Bible where nobody's faith was necessarily exercised to make this happen. I mean, they didn't seek Jesus for this. They didn't come to him saying, can you heal? Can you deliver? Can you resurrect? This, this was one of those situations where they didn't reach out for it because nobody knew him in that way. Because I'd never seen God do that before. I wasn't even going to try to attempt to think he could do it now. But God is a master of setting up situations to reveal himself in ways that we have never experienced him before. Is it possible that some of the things that you're experiencing right now, and I hear some of you saying, I've never had this happen before. I'm dealing with situations that I've never had to deal with before. I'm finding it difficult to find somebody to relate to me because even the people that I relate to have never been through this before. And even some of us who have experienced God in different arenas, there are things that you have not experienced God in. So I know God as a healer. I know God as a way maker. I know that God will give me a job when I'm unemployed. But since we have experienced God in certain levels, there's always levels and dimensions of God that he wants to take us into. And so by divine providence, sometimes he creates situations. He sets up situations not to frustrate you, but to push you into a deeper experience with God. Are you following me this morning? The Bible says that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to show himself strong to those who trust him. In other words, God is always searching for an opportunity to reveal himself to you in an even greater way. I believe this, that many people who have begun cold in their worship and cold in their praise is because you have thought that you have seen all there is to see. And God said there are levels, there are dimensions to this that you haven't even seen yet. And so every once in a while, I'll set up a situation where nobody could get you out of it but me. See, sometimes the things that we call God are things that we have put, we have attributed to medical science. Somebody goes to the doctor and gets healing because the doctors did surgery. Or, or somebody who, has, who is blessed financially 
can attribute it to just good money management, amen, and good investments. So every once in a while, God has to put you in a situation where nobody could get you out of this but him. That God divinely will set up a situation where nobody else could answer. Your mother couldn't get you out. Your father couldn't get you out. It's not where you could go back and say, my pastor got me out or my boss got me out. Is there anybody that knows it like for God to set up a situation in your life that if he doesn't come in, it just won't get done? God is saying, I'm going to set up some situations and show you aspects about myself that you've never seen before. So you can't get caught up in what I have done that you miss what I'm going to do. Some of you are so caught up in what God has done that it doesn't even cross your mind that you have not begun to scratch the surface of what he will do. That even some of the things that you've been through before are not really a good point of reference because I'm going to blow your mind and take you beyond what I thought, what you thought I could do. Is there anybody who's ready to go to another level of faith on this morning? Who's ready to go to another experience with God? Who's ready to go to another level with God? God said, while you're frustrated about situations and occurrences and problems, all I did was set up a canvas so that I could show you my hand in a different way. You knew me as a healer, but I'm going to show up as a lawyer. You knew me as a God who will make a way out of no way, but I'm going to show up in places that you didn't even think I would show up because... I want to show you different aspects. Uh, how do I explain this? God says, I want to show you different dimensions, different colors, different hues. So I, want, I want you to experience me in different dimensions. I, I don't want you to think that I'm, I'm just this and that's all there is to me. I'm the God of heaven. You, you haven't even begun to tap in to how great my glory is. And so instead of complaining about new experience and being frustrated and being scared, God said, I want to use it to push you. Look at somebody and say, he's going to push you into it. Now, follow me here. Now, the Bible says this, that Nain, he went to a place called Nain. Now, that's weird because Nain is not a city that we're acquainted with in the Bible. It's not like some popular city like Jerusalem or Judea or Capernaum. And you don't always look for God in the famous or the popular or the trendy. We have a tendency to look for God in, in the popular places, the trendy places, the, the important people. But, but, but God is not always in there. God is known to do miracles in unlikely places. You got to be careful with God. You, you think God just show up in big churches, popular pastors, big ministries, large cities. But we serve a God who will come right down into Goodlessville in a little church called Impact. With a little known pastor named Faison. And do miracles in our midst. We have to be careful not to box God into being somebody who can only show up in popular places, big places, trendy places. Because the God we serve will show up in unusual places, in unexpected places. He will use people that you do not expect to be used. He's not limited to just the important, the popular, the trendy. But he looks, reaches down and finds people that you don't even know and never even heard of. Have you ever had somebody who didn't have have a great big ministry, didn't have a great big name, but they came to you at a port at a critical time in your life and they spoke a word that changed your life because God said, I'm not limited to the people that you think I can use. In fact, sometimes I use people that you don't expect just to show you I'm God. It's not even about them. It's not about their name. It's not about their stage, but it's about God. I'll use anybody I want to use. I'll use a man. I'll use a woman. I'll use somebody white. I'll use somebody black. I'll use somebody rich. I'll use somebody poor. I'll use a perfect stranger to speak a word in your life because it's not the vessel we're paying attention to, but it's the God behind the vessel. Look at somebody and say, let God use you. Yeah, God will show up in unknown situations for people that you don't expect because as fate would have it, he stumbled upon a funeral procession for a widow woman. The Bible doesn't even dignify her with a name. It's called her a widow woman of name. She wasn't somebody popular in the city. She wasn't somebody popular in the town. Just some nameless widow woman that he stumbled across. Name wasn't on his itinerary. He was just walking through. He just, just happened to be. He, he didn't come to name looking for her. 
He just happened to be going in that direction, and he stumbled across it. You know, sometimes when we stumble across different things, we think it's incident or accidents or coincidence, but in reality, it's a setup. Is it possible that God coming through your situation is not what God just stumbled into it? It looks like God stumbled into it accidentally, but it's really a setup. That is God divinely arranging situations and occurrences so that my power can conflict with your situation. So that the things I'm able to do comes into direct conflict, comes into direct intersecting with the things that you are doing. So he runs across this widow that he wasn't expecting to run into. And the Bible said that when he saw her, he was moved with compassion. We see this phrase a lot in Jesus' ministry. It comes from a Greek word that means inward parts. It's where they get the English word spleen. And so compassion means to be moved by something so deeply that you feel it in the pit of your stomach. Aren't you glad we serve a God that when you are in pain, he can be moved in the pit of his stomach? It wasn't like us who hear about a tragedy and say, oh, I'm praying for you. Oh, that's so sad. Mm, That's a shame. He saw this woman's pain and it moved him to something inside beginning to move. Now, now, if you don't understand what this feels like, I have been in this woman's position where I've had to bury a child. And let me tell you something. No parent should have to bury a child. It's an indescribable pain to have to bury somebody who should be burying you. I have experienced it personally. This church has been through it specifically just more recently where we've had to bury a child. There are many people in this church who have had to bury children. And there's something about having to watch this person that you have pushed out of your body, ladies, and you've nurtured and you've carried and you've cared for, and you're thinking that they're going to be here to bury you and you have to bury them. It's an indescribable pain that is bad to lose anybody, but to lose a child is a pain that you cannot even describe. And when Jesus saw this widow woman who was going down the road to bury her child, something in him moved. I don't believe you can do effective ministry until something in you moves. I don't believe that you can be effective for God until you care about people to the point that something in you moves. That you can't just walk by and say, I'm praying for you. Oh, that's so sad. I'll get back to you. But something on the inside has to move in you. Well, I feel what they feel. Jesus felt this woman on a deep, visceral level. Something inside him moved. I'm so glad the Bible said that we have a high priest that can be moved, that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. That the God that we serve does not have a passive relationship with you. That when you are going through stress and you are going through trouble, when you are going through something that keeps you up at night walking on the floor, that Jesus says, I feel you. How many know that Jesus feels me? There's nothing worse than having somebody minister to you during a tragic time, Brother Kenny, and you can tell you don't feel me. There you are with tears coming down your eyes and you're trying to explain how terrible you feel and how hurt you are and how lonely you are. And they started eating potato chips. Like, mm, ain't that something? But what I want is somebody that when I'm saying to you that I'm in pain, that you feel me. That when you're talking to me, when you're describing my pain, my issues, that I sense something about you that lets me know that you can relate to what I'm talking to. There's nothing worse than somebody trying to minister to you and you know and can tell they have no idea what they're talking about. There you are trying to minister to me in my marital problems and you don't understand what I'm talking about. There you are trying to tell me how to raise my kids and you don't have no clue what I'm talking about. There you are trying to tell me how to pay tithes and come out of my final situation and you can't relate to what I'm going through. How many people know what I'm talking about? I need somebody. The Bible says this about Jesus, that he was a man full of compassion, that he was somebody who could be felt, who could be touched, who could be felt. He was acquainted with grief. He knew what grief felt like. I know what it's like to be in your shoes. And something about this woman's situation made Jesus stop in his tracks. Oh, my God. To have the kind of God who will stop everything and come see about me the kind of God that will interrupt the whole service and come see about me 
See, I like crowds. I like big crowds. I like having a whole room full of people. But I serve a God who will step right in the middle of a praise service and speak a word directly to you. The best messages I've ever heard are the ones where I felt like the preacher was talking right to me. He might have been talking to everybody, but I felt Jesus talking directly to me. Is there anybody here that feels God speaking directly to you? We have people online watching. We have people on YouTube watching. We have people that will watch later. But there are some people that when they hear this word, I feel you, God, speaking to me. I may not wave my hand. I may not pat my foot. I may not jump up and down. But I'm listening intently because I hear what God is saying to me. The Bible says, let the heathen have an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So I lift your hands and say, Lord, speak to me. He felt it on a deep, visceral level. And stopped. Here is what's so interesting. When Jesus was coming up the way, he came with all of his disciples and all of his crew and all of his followers. And coming out of the city was a woman mourning. The Bible said the whole city followed her. So here was one group of people who were coming with life. And another group of people who were coming to mourn death. And it just so happened that these two extremes collided on the road to Nain. If this were a prize fight, <laughs> if this were a boxing match, you would have in this corner the resurrection, the life, the alpha, the omega, the great Jehovah, the great Emmanuel. And in this corner, you would have death. Who brags that I have won for centuries. I've never lost a fight. That men great and small have had to succumb to my wiles. That I've seen princes and I've seen kings and I've seen men and I've seen women. I am undefeated. In this corner, I have death who is undefeated. And I have Jesus over here who is the resurrection and the life. And both of these things collided at this moment and look at the crowd. If this were a prize fight, this would have been the fight of the century. Yeah, it, this would have been the fight. This would have been the main event. Because nobody knew exactly what was going to happen. It never happened before. Nobody knew exactly what Jesus was going to do. All of a sudden, Jesus was coming face to face with death who had bragged for years that nobody has been able to get away from me. This kid is just another man. Who had to succumb to my power. So let me talk about the God who talks to somebody who is on the way. Because what I suspect in here is somebody, your dream has died. And it's not where you buried it, but you're on the way. I'm on the way. I'm, I'm, I'm on the way. I haven't, I haven't left church yet, but I'm, I'm on the way. I ain't left the marriage yet, but I'm on the way. I, I haven't quit yet. I haven't walked out yet, but all the signs are there that I'm on my way out. You know what I found out about people? That sometimes when they're out, they're gone before they're gone. How many people know what I'm talking about? That most people who divorce, it's not where they wake up one day and I get a divorce. It's been coming for a while. Yeah, they might have just told you today, but it was gone years ago. Huh? Come on, talk to me. That most people who leave a church, it's not where I walk in one day and say, I ain't coming back. They've been left. Yeah, it's something about the way they do what they do that announces to you that, that, that I'm not there yet, but I'm on the way. And I come to talk to somebody and stop somebody who's on the way to burying your dream. To burying the thing that God has given to you. It's not there yet, but you're just about giving up on it. Yeah, it is what it is. I'm done with that. All I'm trying to do now is find an acceptable place to put my disappointments, to find a box somewhere where I don't have to see it. There's nothing like the pain of having to bury something that you were expecting to happen. If you ain't got no expectation, you have no clue what I'm talking about. But there's nothing, there's something, there's nothing like the pain of having to say goodbye to something that you really was counting on happening. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I, I was expecting to be married by now. 
I was expecting this business to be up by now. I was expecting this ministry to be forward by now. I was expecting to have this job by now. I've been sick for a long time. I was expecting the doctor said it was only going to be three months. It's been six years. And you get to a place with disappointment where you just say, I'm over it. I'm over it. It's not going to happen. It's not going to change. It's not going to be any different. I'm just trying to find me a place somewhere where I can put it out of my sight and not have to deal with it anymore. See, sometimes the thing that makes disappointment frustrating is when you got to keep looking at it and thinking about what it could have been. Anybody ever been there? I'm looking at this kid and I'm wondering what you could have been. I'm looking at this marriage and thinking to myself, my God, what it could have been. I'm looking back over 20 years of my life and thinking to myself who I could have been. I started out with so much energy and drive and hope and anticipation, and I just knew I was going to be the next hot thing. But it's been five years. It's been 10 years. It's been 20 years. And at a certain point, I know you can't say amen, but at a certain point, when you wait on something for a long time, you start thinking, I'm over it. I want to talk to somebody who feels like I'm over it. I'm over it. I took these lessons and I thought I was going to be awesome by the time I was 25. It ain't happened yet. I'm 50. I'm over it. I want to talk to somebody who looking at their ministry or the calling on your life or the things that God has promised. Is there anybody here that God has promised you things that have not come to pass yet? Maybe, maybe you have all of it. But I know it's like to have things that God spoke to me as a kid, but they still haven't happened yet. And you start moving to a place emotionally where you say, I'm over it. Now, you don't say it out publicly. You don't say it openly, but inwardly, you're over it. You know how I can tell you're over it? Because you start preparing a coffin for it. All a coffin is is a box that you put the thing in so that you don't have to see it. And here this woman was on her way. She wasn't quite there yet. And I came by this morning to stop somebody because you're not quite there yet, but you're on your way. I've seen the light go out in your eyes. I've seen it in the way you serve. I've seen it in the way you pray. I've seen it in the way you worship. I've seen it in the way you approach the worship of God, where you used to do it with vigor and energy and fervency. You kind of do it like, when is this going to be over? Because I'm over it. I'm over believing that God is going to open up that door for me. In fact, I'm trying to find me a way out right now because I'm tired of dealing with disappointment. Is there anybody here who's tired of dealing with disappointment? The Bible says this, Michael, that hope deferred makes the heart sick. It's hoping and hoping and waiting and waiting and it doesn't happen. That's what makes your heart sick. If there anybody knows or like to deal with the pain of having a heartache that nothing seems to fix. I tried to smoke it out. I tried to drink it out. I tried to sex it out. I was just trying to get over my disappointment of something that I thought was going to happen and it never did happen. And I'm looking at you mad because you are probably the reason why it didn't happen. So now I'm having all these negative feelings about you because I'm, you know, because that's how we do. We got to blame it on something. We got to blame it on somebody. If it wasn't for you, I'd be okay. Oh, y'all ain't going to say amen. I'm going to step on some more toes. I'm on the way. I'm not quite there yet. I'm on, I'm on the way. And then they ran to Jesus, number two, who stepped in the way. I was on the way. Put it up on a coffin. Heading to the funeral graveyard. And all of a sudden, Jesus gets in the way. How disrespectful. How disrespectful. Here I am, God, trying to get around you, and you stepping right in my way. Is there anybody God has ever stepped right in your way, on the way of you being over it, done with it, walking out? He stepped right in the way and said, not yet. How rude. Disrespectful. Even today, when you see people riding down the road in a funeral procession on the, in the cars, we pull over out of the way out of respect for the dead, even if we don't know them, even if we don't know the family, respectfully, if the funeral's coming this way, we move out of the way and let them pass. How disrespectful for Jesus to step right dead in the way. 
I'm over it, God. I'm over this marriage. I'm over this job. I'm over this church. I'm over this woman. I'm over this career. I'm over this ministry. Give me a box and let me put it in the ground. And Jesus stepped in right. Come on, God. Don't get in my way. And he steps right in, in the way. He stepped in the way because he knew what he was going to do. I come to tell somebody that God stopped me, told me to come by here today to stop you on the way to your own funeral. <laughs> oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. Just before you sign the divorce papers, just before you quit the job, just before you walk out of the school, God stopped by to say, not yet. I want to tell you about a God who will get in your way. Who will frustrate your plans. When you're doing everything you can to get out of it, he'll still be pulling you back and saying, not yet. Not yet. When you said there wasn't no more left in you, God said there's still something down in you. When you thought there was no place you were going to go with your ministry, something down on the inside will begin to stir. I want to talk to somebody who's gotten so frustrated with God that you said, I ain't going to praise him. I ain't going to worship him. I'm not going to serve him. And you feel like the prophet has said, I wasn't going to preach no more. But when I said I wasn't going to do it, something down on the inside began to stir and I had to give him a praise. Woo! Somebody came today and said, my life is so frustrated. My life is so upside down that I can't even lift my hands and I'm ready to walk out and quit. But somewhere during the worship service, something down on the inside began to stir and I had to give God a praise. If that's you, give God a praise right here. Maybe they don't understand, Angela. I, I know what it's like to come in and not expect nothing to happen. <laughs> I don't expect nothing to happen, Mike. I just came because it was Sunday. I'm just going to endure it. Looking at my watch, hour and a half, we'd be done, and I'm back to my life. And to then have God show up unexpectedly. I don't even know exactly when it happened. See, we have a worship planner with our service, and we have everything timed out, and we have everything staked. At 9.45, this is going to happen. At 10.15, this is going to happen. At 11 o'clock, this is going to happen. We have this stuff timed out. But one of the things I realized is that you can't program God. Oh, we have a method to our madness. We have an order and a structure. But one of the things I realized, sis, is that I can't really tell you when God is going to move. He might move through the pre-service. He might move during the worship. He might move during the offering. He might move during the message. He might move in the altar call and the benediction. I can't tell God when he's going to move. All I know is that he's going to do it. If you want God to do something in your life, all you got to do is raise your expectations and God will show up. Somebody expect God to, give, to bless you. Give God a praise right here. I don't know when you're going to do it, but I know you're going to do it. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm open. That's what we need in our worship service. We need to be open. Just open. I don't know when God's going to do it or how or what he's going to say, but I know he's going to do it. Lift your hands right here and say, Lord, I'm open. God will get in the way. He'll get in the way. I know it's like to have God interrupt my plans. You should have saw the stuff I was planning to do. Connie, I had it all mapped out. I put this money aside. I made the phone call. I made the arrangements. I bought the ticket. I picked the location and have God tear up your whole itinerary. I felt like Jonah, sis. I was trying to get away from the ministry. And God kept getting in the way. Oh, my God. I serve a God that says that when I start something, I'm going to stay on until I finish it. I'm not going to let you give up on yourself. Your daddy might have given up on you. Your mama may have given up on you. Your wife may have given up on you. Your friend may have given up on you. But I'm not giving up on you. I'm going to get right in your way. I'm in the way. I, I would quit, but I can't. I, I would walk away, sis, but I can't. Something got a hold of me. See, I used to think I was saved because of my grip I had on God. But the truth be told, 
It's because of God's grip on me. Can I get a witness in here? That the truth be told, it's not that I'm so strong or so smart or so gifted or even that committed. It's just that when I wanted to walk away, God wouldn't let me go. Is there anybody in here that God just refused? No. He refused. Suicide didn't work because God had his hand on me. Killing myself didn't work because he had his hand on me. I was doing what I wanted to do. But I didn't like what I was doing because he had his hand on me. Is there anybody that's glad that God had his I want to talk to somebody in here whom God has his hands on. Because he that have begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You may make some twists. You may make some turns. You may make some bad mistakes. But when it's all said and done, God said, I want to put my, I want to take my hands off you and I'm going to get in the way. No wonder who you was dating didn't work out because I was in the way. No wonder you tried to go to that city and it just didn't happen because I was in the way. No wonder you threw away your Bible and hung up your robe and said, I'm not preaching no more. But you had to get you a message in the middle of the night because I was in the way. Is there anybody who's glad that God got in the way? That if God didn't get in the way when he did, I wouldn't even be here. I feel like having church all by myself. If God didn't step between me and the thing I wanted to do, that I wouldn't even be here. I'm so glad that I'm God stepped in the way. Oh my God. Is there anybody give God 30 seconds for God being in the way? Sometimes being in the way wasn't pleasant. Sometimes it was jail that stopped me. Sometimes it was getting fired that stopped me. Sometimes it was getting divorced that stopped me. Sometimes it was folks walking out on me that stopped me. God has a million ways of getting your attention. I don't care how you do it, God. Just get in my way. Get in my way. Get in my way. I'm, I'm, I, God's too heavy. For me to push out of the way, Mark. When the Holy Ghost throws his weight around, you can't push him out the way. I'm a little over 200 pounds. If you push me hard enough, I'll move. But the God we serve said, I'm too big. <laughs> I'm too wide. I'm too heavy. When you decide to push me around, it ain't going to work. When you decide to shut me out your life, it ain't going to work. I'll shut you down before you shut me down. Here was Jesus got in the way and for a moment it was tense because everybody stood still and there's something about that place between what God says and what he does that makes it tense have you ever been in a situation where I just wasn't sure where everything was on pause I'm not sure which way this is going to go I'm not sure if the devil's going to win this or if God's going to win this. I'm not sure if I'm going to fight this thing or run from this thing. And there's that tense moment when you're not quite sure whether you're going to get through or not. I, am I talking to anybody in here? That place between victory and defeat where things are on pause and you're not sure. And it was tense because Jesus was in the way. And suddenly he speaks to the boy and tells him to get up. Connie, he didn't even touch the boy. He touched the box. He touched the thing that was carrying the boy. For somebody, God said, I'm going to touch your box. I'm going to touch the things that you used to hide what you were disappointed about. I'm going to touch the things that's in the way between me and you. I'm going to touch the box, but everything in the box is going to get up. Oh, I wish I had a church this morning. I wish I had a real church this morning. God said to tell somebody, when I touch your box, everything in the box is going to get up. Every dream, every desire, every expectation, everything you said wasn't going to happen is all of a sudden you start getting up. I'll know it's happening, sis, when I'm excited about stuff that I put to bed a long time ago. 
I'll know it's happening when I start talking about stuff that I had given up on a long time ago. I thought it wasn't going to happen. I put it away. I said it's too late. I'm too old. It's too past. I missed my moment. But all of a sudden, I'm excited like I was when I was 15 years old because he's touched my box. God touched this box. You know what I see in this room right now? I see a room full of dreams that had died. I see a room full of disappointments. I see a room full of people who just decided it wasn't going to happen. But the Holy Ghost said, I came by this morning to touch this box, this church, this room. And when I touch this room, when I touch this room, everything that's dead in here is going to suddenly get up. Oh my God, I wish somebody heard what God was saying in here. I see the disappointment in people's faces of what could have, should have, would have been. But I hear the Holy Ghost laying his hands on this box right here. That's why you came this morning. Because God said everything in you that's dead is about to get up. Look at somebody say, it's about to get up. My praise is about to come back to life. My worship is about to come back to life. My devotion is about to come back to life. I'm getting ready to dream again. I'm getting ready to have energy again. I'm getting ready to have strength again. Touch this box. Lift your hands right here. Say, Lord, touch this box. Touch this box. Touch this box. Touch, touch this church. Touch, touch this house. Touch this family until I get my fight back again. Touch this place until my anointing comes again. Touch this box until my joy comes back again. The joy of the Lord is my strength I need. You know why we're so intense about our worship? Because God wants to touch your box. You got me boxed in. You got me bent. You got me bent. If you think that the God of glory, that's all I'm going to do, you got me twisted. I'm the God that made heaven and earth. I'm the God that stepped on the middle of nothing and created everything. Your problem is not too big for me, but your box, your box. It wasn't even like a real coffin where they close it, sis. It was more like a bed. He touched the bed. They carried him out on a bed because they wanted everybody to see it on the way to the grave. And sometimes when you're going through things, everybody see it. And God said, I want everybody to see it. I want them to look at it and say, yep, that situation is dead because when I do it, I'm going to do it in the face of your enemies, in the face of your critics, in the face of people that said it wasn't going to happen, in the face of your haters, in the face of people that said it wasn't going to work. Would somebody give God praise for the things he's about to resurrect in your life? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You almost there. I'm going to tell you something else. When the boy got up, the Bible said he started speaking. And it reminded me of what the Lord said in the Old Testament. He said, write the vision and make it plain. Because in the end, Carmen, it shall speak. God said to tell somebody, you ain't going to have to talk. I'm going to let it speak for you. Stop arguing with people about what God's going to do. Let success speak for itself. It shall speak. For somebody, your vision is talking. For somebody, your dream is talking. For somebody, your opportunity is talking. I wish I had somebody whose dream was talking. I ain't got time to argue with you because my dream is talking to me. I ain't got time to be mad at you because my dream is talking to me. My dream is talking so loud, I can't hear your criticism. Where are my dreamers at in here? Where my dream is out of here, holler at your boy. My dream is talking. Find three people and say, let your dream speak. Let your dream speak. You ain't got to answer your critics. Let, the speak. let success speak for itself. You ain't got to answer your kind. Let your dreams speak for itself. In the end, it shall speak. I hear somebody dream speaking to me. 
is talking in an audible voice and is saying that which was dead is now alive. Ah. Touch somebody and say, I feel my strength coming back. Touch three people and say, I feel my strength coming back. If I'm getting on your nerves with my praise, it's because my dance is coming back. If I'm making too much noise, it's because I feel my praise coming back. If, if, if I'm talking too much and I'm being too excited, it's because I feel my thing coming back. You don't hear me. I feel my... Th Look what happened. When the people saw their dream come back, the same people that was walking out crying left rejoicing. <laughs> you get what I said? The same people that walked, were walking out of the city mourning, when God resurrected that boy, they went back rejoicing. He turned a funeral into a praise and worship service. I'm going to sit there. He turned a tragedy into a triumph. He turned what should have been mourning and crying into a shout. I don't know who I came to talk to, but I'm going to tell you right now, I didn't come to go to a funeral. I came to go to a celebration service for everybody in here that feels God resurrecting your dream. This party is for you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me demonstrate it like this. Somebody turn around in your seat. Just turn around. See, you can't do this sitting down. You got to turn around in your seat. God said, I'm about to do a U-turn in your life. Everything that looked like it was going in that direction is about to turn around and go back in the other direction. Somebody turn around again and say, God's going to do a U-turn. He turned it. He turned my mourning into dancing. He turned my sorrow into joy. He turned my poverty into prosperity. He turned it. He turned it. for me. I need some radical folk to do this. I want you to walk up to about three people and tell them that the funeral is canceled. The funeral is canceled. I don't know what you were preparing to bury, but God said that the you ain't telling nobody. The funeral is canceled. It's a celebration service. It's a praise service. It's a turnaround service. Yeah! this he turned it for me Angela you thought it was over I was just getting started <laughs>
Somebody that's happy, begin to turn around right now. He's turning it for me. He's turning my financial situation around. He's turning my marriage around. He's turning my house around. Now listen, listen, I, 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 I told you something at the beginning of the message. I said that there were only three instances where Jesus raised somebody from the dead during his ministry, but that's really incorrect. There's really a fourth time that it happened. It happened with the Lord God himself when they hung him on a cross and they put him in a grave and they closed up the grave and they said it was over. They said he was never coming back, but three days later, here comes my God getting up out the grave. And the Bible said that the same power that's in your God is down in you. That means if he got up, you can get up too. If he got out, you can get out too. I wish I had somebody. my joy here comes my dance back here comes my joy back here cause you thought that I was dead devil here comes my dance again here comes my joy again here comes my praise again clap those hands hot Listen, lift your hands right here. 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 Begin to worship. Lift your hands right here. Begin to worship. There is a power down in you. God, God has put something down in you that is too tough to die. Too stubborn to die. Too tough to die. The same power that God put down in Jesus. Yes. He's put down in you. Hallelujah. The enemy wants you to give up. The enemy wants you to quit. He's always telling you how it's not worth it. How it's not working. I'm tired of bumping my head against the wall. I've already put my dream on a cart. And I'm heading down to the graveyard right now. I'm over it. I decided it ain't gonna happen. After 20 years, if it ain't happened, maybe it's not supposed to. I've been dealing with this for a long time, Daphne. I've got like those people who said, if you can't kill it, then just join it. And I was just about ready to succumb to depression. And something on the inside, sis. <laughs> something on the inside didn't come out of my flesh. Didn't come out of my intellect. In fact, I'd already decided I was done. But something down on the inside began to stir. Somebody lift your hands right here because God said there's a stirring in the spirit right now. There's a stirring in the spirit right now. There's a stirring way down on the inside right now. That God is touching something way down on the inside of you. That part of you that's too stubborn to die, I won't quit. I'm not dying right here. Not right here. I shall not die, but I shall live and declare the works of the Lord. Somebody open your mouth and begin to declare the goodness of the Lord right here. 
if the devil had his way, you wouldn't even be here. But I'm still here because of the goodness of God. I'm still here because God's hand is on me. I'm still here because God's goodness is on me. There's something down in me that just wouldn't die, that just wouldn't cancel the funeral. Send the flowers back. I'm not dying right here, Carmen. I'm going to keep on keeping on. Somebody's got to fight down in you. Open your mouth. Begin to give God a praise. I'm going to fight. Not here, devil. Not here, devil. I done been through too much. I've survived too much. I've gone through too much. I've dealt with too much for me to get all the way here and die. Cancel that. All my haters that was planning a party, God said, cancel the party. <laughs> All of you that was hoping that I wouldn't survive, cancel the party. All of you that was betting I wouldn't get out, cancel the party. Because I'm coming back, sis. I'm coming back, brother. I'm coming back, Leah. You thought it was over, but I ain't done with you yet. Lift your hands and worship right here. Lift your hands and worship right here. Lift your hands and worship right here. The Holy Spirit is hovering over somebody's life right now saying, your situation has been on life support for years, but I'm speaking life into it right now. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. I'm speaking life into your ministry. Come on, you put your ministry on the shelf. You said it's too late. You said it can't happen. You made excuses for it. You made all kind of promises that you couldn't keep, but God said, when I called you, I made, I knew what you was going to go through before you went through it, and I called you anyway. Let me lay my hands on you. Let the Holy Ghost lay his hands on you, because that thing, that thing, yeah, there it is, that thing right there, that thing right there, that thing right there, that part of you that won't die, that won't give up, that won't quit, that you that God was God said that's it sis that's it sis that's it sis that's it sis that's what I'm talking about I'm coming all the way out of it I'm coming all the way out of it get up off that bed get up off that bed get up off those excuses come out come out wherever you are Some of you, God's been calling you to ministry. You've been making excuse after excuse. It's time for you to get off that bed. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care what you've had to deal with. You have got to get off that bed. Cancel that funeral. God said, I ain't done with you yet. You think that I anointed you so you could die right here? The devil is a lie. I command you. It's going to be a turnaround Sunday in here today. I feel revival in this house. I feel somebody getting back in position, Daphne. I feel somebody saying yes to their calling. Lift your hands and say yes. Somebody say yes. He's in the house. He's in the house. Come here, Daphne. Lay your hands on my sister right here. He's in the house. Right there, right there. He's in the house. Just lay your hands on her. Don't even say nothing to her. Just lift your hands. Just lay your hands on her right there. He's in the house. You need to understand that God has made too much of an investment in you to let you go out like that. Too much in you. Too much in you, Hannah, for you to go out like that. The devil is a lie. You got, you're not gonna run me out of here like that. Too much, Angela. Too much, too much, too much, too much, too much, too much, too much Tony, too much, too much. 
everything, thank you, Lord, everything. God said, tell somebody, everything that got away from you, I'm going to give it back to you. God, I got to sit down. God said, everything you thought got away from you, I'm going to give it back to you. Everything you thought escaped your grip, I'm about to give it back to you. And it's going to come back bigger than you thought. Oh, I wish I had somebody who was excited about this. It ain't too late for you, sis. I'm still going to give it back to you. You still going to find love. You still going to start the business. You still going to serve in the ministry. You still going to give God glory. You're still, I'm going to give it back to you. I wish I had. Lift your hands and say, I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. Come on, I receive it. Open your mouth and tell them I receive it. So I just stop by and tell somebody, don't bury your dream yet. Don't bury your dream yet. There's still something in it. There's still something God wants to do through you. There's still, you still got time. There's still something God wants to accomplish through your life. Don't, don't bury your dream yet. Don't, don't walk away from it yet. There's still something God wants to accomplish through your ministry and through your life. I know you've been through some stuff and I know you've had some stuff on top of you and I know you've had some things that hurt you, but God said, I'm not done with you yet. I'm not through with it yet. I was just using it to process you. I was using it to bring something out of you. I was using your situation to show them that I am the resurrection. The resurrection is not an event. I am the resurrection. Wherever I show up, life comes in the room. I wish I had somebody who heard me. God said, I'd use your situation to show how powerful I am. Loose God. Oh, shit. Do it, God. 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 Somebody open your mouth and lift your hands and say, Lord, do it, God. Do it, God, in me. Do it, God. Do it, God, in me, in me, in me, right here. Do it, God, do it. Give me my joy back. Give me my peace back. Give me my praise back. Give me my fight back. Give me my drive back. Give me my energy back. Give me my passion back. Give me my joy back. Let the Lord minister to you. Let the Lord minister to you. There's a sweet presence of the Lord in here. It's not in the shout. It's not in the jump. There's a worship in here. Because I see something coming back to life. I see something standing up and starting to talk. Something way down on the inside. Something you buried and decided wasn't going to happen. I see it coming up in you right now. It's happening in the men. It's happening in the women. It's happening in the children. They're coming out of it right now. I feel the Holy Ghost resurrecting somebody right now. I feel the Holy Ghost lifting somebody up out of it right now. Come up out of that depression. Come up out of that fear. Come up out of that worry. Come up out of that anger. Come up out of that anger. Come up out of it. God said, God said, God said, come. Just like that. Just like that. Just like that. The Holy Ghost. Have your way. Holy Ghost. Just like that. Just like that. Holy Ghost. Have your way. It's all over you. It's all over you. It's all over you. It's all over you. You can't shake this. You can't shake this. You can't. 